Hello everyone. Hello guys. Welcome. Today we are going to discuss more about marketing magic, how you can get great results, how you can write your story and get a lot of sales. I'm so excited to discuss this topic with Stu. Steve Malter, how are you? So good to be with you and all of your listeners and all of your subscribers on Atoli. I'm looking very, very forward to this. This is great. Yeah, big pleasure, big pleasure. Wanna learn more about storytelling? Uh, I think I spent so much time to craft my stories, and it's not the end of the story. When you can get the best skills, you need to improve, to update what you have, to uh, create something new. Because in marketing, what I like, it's a quickly changing world. We need to adapt fast, whatever happens. But even having AI, even having all these technologies, we need to craft our stories uh, for human beings. Steve, before you start, just tell more about yourself, experience, background, and anything that can help our listeners to learn more about you. Absolutely. So um, I came out of a performance background. So I was an actor for many, many years, and I accidentally in the 1990s, for those who are old like me, who might remember it, I accidentally stumbled into this world back during the dot-com era of the mid-1990s into the late 1990s of what was then known as corporate theater. It was the idea of bringing in experts to stand on a stage and represent large corporations and help them to tell their stories. Because what we realized back at that time was that while engineers, designers, developers, manufacturers are excellent at building product, their primary relationship is with a lab or with a computer monitor, not necessarily in human-to-human -human communication. So a lot of those people who were being asked to speak on behalf of their own product was like forcing a round peg into a square hole. It just didn't work. They didn't enjoy telling their own stories. The audience didn't enjoy listening to them because, again, engineers not always the best communicators. And so they would bring in people like me to speak on their behalf. And then over time, I learned that the corporate stories that a lot of these fortune brands were telling to their global audience, whether these were customers, clients, or partners, or media analysts, it wasn't really the story that the audience wanted to hear. So very early on, I started to develop my mantra that I have with me to this day and that I encourage all of your listeners and everybody who wants to get ahead in marketing to adopt the same mantra. And that is, don't tell them what you want to tell them. Tell them what they want to hear. Meaning, speak as though you are speaking in the voice of your audience, your listener, rather than in your own voice. And throughout the past 25 years of meeting in this industry, that's exactly what I've tried to do for my own clients, is I work with large fortune brands, uh, Cisco, Panasonic, Siemens, HP, Intel, uh, Fujifilm, on and on we could go. But I work with their marketing leadership and their executive leadership, their C-suite, to say, okay, what is the beating heart of your brand really all about? It's not products. It's not solutions. It's not services. Anybody can get those anywhere from any number of, of, of vendors. What is special about this particular company? What makes it tick? And how do you connect the heartbeat of your brand to the heartbeat of your customers, your clients, your industry, your sector? That's what I help them to do is tell a more personal human story that goes beyond the product, the solution, the service, the capability, makes that connection with the customer and all of a sudden elevates that particular brand in their eyes and creates a long-term relationship. That's what I do. That's what I'm all about. And it's what I love to help others figure out as well. Awesome. Yeah. I love your experience. Great experience. Uh, and I want to start my first question with something that I can't agree but it doesn't mean that I'm right about that. <laughs> so yeah, let's figure out uh, the best way. I mean, like uh, Steve, you mentioned that you need to write for customers or users. I agree a hundred percent. We need to write for them, but uh, you mentioned that you need to write for them, even ignoring your personal voice. But I, I, I can't agree with that. Probably uh, I didn't get it right. But I mean, like if I write something, I usually uh, highlight myself. I usually share my personal stories. Of course, I consider my users, uh, customers. I can tell them what they want to get, but I want to be myself. So tell uh, what I didn't get right about your You message. are 100% correct. I am so glad that, you, that we're starting at that particular point. It's a great place to begin because, yes, telling your customer's story 
from their perspective doesn't mean sacrificing your own story. Mm -hmm. It means finding correlation, alignment between your story and theirs in a way that your customer or your audience, and by the way, when I use the word audience, everybody thinks one person standing on stage in front of 10,000 people. No, an audience can be an audience of one. Right now, I am speaking, you are my audience. A moment ago, you were speaking, I was your audience. So I use that word audience to mean the person who was on the receiving end of your communication. But the way that you create the best alignment with the audience is when you speak about something where they recognize themselves in that story, where they look and they say, Anatoly understands me. He knows what I'm all about. He speaks the same language that I do. His experiences are similar to mine, and therefore I can trust him. He has credibility. His story is worth listening to, so I want to lay, lean in, and I want to pay attention to that story. And the smartest brands in the world know how to do that. So it's not that they sacrifice their own story for the sake of the customer. It's that they know their customer. They know their audience well enough to be able to tell a story that makes sense to them. And the best way we do that is we say, we speak the same language. We're on the same page. We share the same challenges. We look for the same success and the same solutions. Brands that successfully do that, as opposed to just talking about their product and all of the details that you can just as easily read off of a website or out of a brochure, the ones that can turn it into a real story are the ones that fly and succeed. And we have proof of that again and again and again with the top performing corporations all over the world. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Steve. Uh, I want to ask about fake stories. If I go to chat GPT, <laughs> I, I can ask chat, please help me to write uh, a story and I can get the story. I played with that many times. Um, yeah, I don't know how chat GPT can <laughs> write all the stories, but all of them are fake. Uh, can you tell, is it a good idea to use fake stories or uh, it's not? <laughs> oh, and it's only such a good question. All right. ChatGPT, AI in general, whatever AI you use, it is a tool. It is not a replacement for communication and connection with a fellow human being. It can be incredibly valuable, but I'll tell you, as somebody who speaks literally weekly all over the world, I just got back last night from Barcelona, Smart City Expo, working with Cisco, and I am headed off tomorrow morning to speak uh, uh, with and train for Snowflake out in uh, Silicon Valley, every company that has a speaker that gets up and speaks to me utilizing AI, I can spot it a million miles away. Like you said, empty, completely fake. There's no heart to it. They've taken highlights and they've put them together as though that is enough for an audience. And I'm telling you, an audience can see right through it. However, ChatGPT, AI in general, can be an excellent tool for figuring out, okay, here is what I want to say. And the more you give to the AI, the more it's going to give you back structure. And structure is vital because an audience requires structure in order to achieve clarity, to know what you want to say, the order that you want to say it in, and why it matters. However, it's just the starting point. A smart speaker, a smart communicator, a smart salesperson, a smart representative for their brand will utilize the AI for the fundamentals, the basics, and then they take them, and that's about 10% of the job, maybe 15%. The other 85 to 90% comes from here. It's looking at what ChatGP has delivered out to you and said, okay, that's nice as a fundamental basis, but it's not the actual story. The story comes from me. So you can use it as a foundational tool, but it can't replace good communication. And like you said, if you just use it, if somebody just puts it in, takes it, speaks, totally fake. It doesn't make any sense. You have to make it your own. That takes time. It takes energy and it takes personal investment which is truly the very least that any audience of yours, your clients, your customers, it's the least they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, valuable. Uh, Steve, I'm curious about your cooperation with big brands. You mentioned all these brands, well, known brands like HP. Uh, and uh, I know these big companies have own departments, marketers, PR specialists, uh, I don't know, ACOs, a, a lot of great people in their teams. So basically, if they cooperate with experts like you, you need to give something more than their own departments can do. So tell what you can do to such big brands if they usually hire top expert specialists on their teams. Okay, so Anatoly, you just said the magic word, experts. When people say to me, all right, who are the hardest people, Steve, for you to train 
or for you to coach or for you to get to that part of the story and away from simply product-based communications to your customer base and to your industry. Who are the hardest to work with? And I always say, you know who the hardest are? Experts. Mm -hmm. The more you know about something and the longer you've spent in your field, the more expert you become and the less powerful you become as a communicator. And the reason is for all of us in our companies, we think about our story, our product, our capability all day long, morning till night. We go to sleep thinking about it. We wake up thinking about it. And then when we get up to communicate about it, we assume that everybody else has the same expertise about our topic that we do, that they think about it every bit as much. So we just talk, but we don't listen. We don't give our audience the benefit of saying, I think about this all the time. Even though you are an expert in your field, you don't think about my field as much as I do. So allow me to help you get there. Allow me to help you move into the same space I am so you can feel my passion and experience it yourself and so that you can become more of an expert on the topic that I'm here to share with you. Those are the best corporations that I work with. And usually it is when a new CMO arrives at the company and they show up and they say, it's not working. We're not getting the success. We're not getting the payoff that we're looking for. Why? Because we have fallen into a rut. We're telling the same story again and again and again and expecting to get better results. What do they say? That's the definition of insanity, right? Trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different uh, uh, turnout, a different result. So usually it's a brand new CMO or a brand new head of a business unit marketing that says, we need to work with somebody like Steve to get back to the heart of the corporate story that's really going to respond, that's really going to drive interest from our marketplace and is then over time going to have a reflection on our bottom line. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, personally, I cooperate with many marketing experts. We can help customers in marketing, PR, but I cooperate with people who can provide more than I can or my team, uh, so that's okay. You know, we, we cooperate with great experts. Uh, Steve, uh, I wanna ask you. I wanna ask about your coaching style. Uh, according to data, people uh, remember only a tiny percent of new skills. Uh, it's it doesn't matter what kind of format. Uh, for example, if you read a new book, you can remember like fifty percent uh, in the first uh, hour. And you can forget the rest 50% in, in a few days. You know, if you tell me something new, I can forget fast, even faster than an hour, because many things to do, you know, it's our life. But it's important to transfer data, especially if you speak about big companies like IHP. Uh, you need to transfer data to someone who will transfer to decision makers or, and uh, manage the people. And according to data, uh, for, for example, if companies pay like, uh, let's imagine 100k to you, and 60% uh, of all this money are wasted because nobody can implement uh, your ideas. So tell how you simplify the process of teaching something about storytelling to big companies when they have a lot of departments, a lot of people, a lot of decision makers, your methods to do it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's so true. And again, you've got a lot of experience in this, Anatoly. I find frequently that the most successful companies are the ones that create consistent messaging across their entire sector, but also across each of their individual divisions so that nobody is siloed. The left hand always knows what the right hand is doing. Hardest thing in the world to do with a large company. And the larger the company gets, the more entrenched the company is the harder that is to do. Like I said, my longest term uh, customer who I've been working with for years, I've been a face and voice for Cisco now for 27 years. A lot of business units, massive global corporation with a remarkable voice, but not always a voice that speaks in unison. So one of the things that I love to do in coaching is I always start with content. And I always say there are three things that we want to do for an audience every time we speak or every time we are in communication. Again, that's whether it's with one person, a colleague, somebody on our team, a director, somebody who's above us, or a customer, a client, a full audience in an arena. Three things that we always want to be searching for in our content. And you can hit one or more of these at any given time. Number one, create differentiation. What do you have to say? that changes the paradigm for your listener, that says this is something different. 
that you have never heard before. I'm not just going to spout off the same thing you've heard again and again. I'm not just going to talk about how great my brand is or how great my product is because that's going to bore you. How do I create differentiation for you with what I'm saying right now? Number two, clear an obstacle out of their path. So often, our audience, again, whether it's an audience of one or an audience of 500, they're just looking for how to move forward. And for whatever reason, they can't do it. There's something blocking their way. And if you can be the one that gets up in front of them and says, hey, how about if I take that thing out of your way and open up your path to success? Sound good? Good. Let me do that for you. If you can clear an obstacle out of their path, you're their superhero. They will listen to anything you have to say and follow you anywhere. And then number three, motivate them to action. Mm -hmm. Because the only communication that is worth having is one that is followed up by a change, by somebody going out and doing something to move themselves forward from where they started the conversation, then at the end of the conversation, time to get going. So always be gunning, look at your content, always be gunning to do one of three things, create differentiation, clear an obstacle out of their path. That can be a wall, a boulder, it can be a little pebble from their shoe. Doesn't matter, clear the obstacle. And then number three, motivate them to take action. And when I work with people, groups of sales leaders, executive leaders working on winning communication and executive leadership skills or working with an individual speaker, I always try to drive them to one or more of those three targets. Check your content, check your conversation, and make sure you are always doing one or more of those three things. Oh, great. Yeah, I'll consider all of them. <laughs> great points. Um, Steve, um, let's talk about... Uh, creating non-boring content. I often have this issue. Uh, I cooperate with uh, great companies, big companies, um, yeah, good money there. And uh, uh, I often see when they create valuable content, really valuable content, but it's boring. When it's boring, people bounce fast, you know, it doesn't matter. It, nobody knows if it's valuable or not, if it's boring, you know. Uh, and according to data, people uh, skip watching YouTube videos, 80% uh, of people skip like in the first 20 seconds. If I open any video from Mr. Beast, you know, he can win me in 20 minutes. I, I can't stop watching this video because he's great, you know, to create uh, interesting content. But uh, Oh, uh, he doesn't share about business. He doesn't share about uh, B2B. Uh, so uh, it's more tough when you have no experience on that. Uh, you can share valuable insights, uh, helpful, but if it's boring, people don't care about mm. this value. So tell how to do it, how to win customers with uh, creating non-boring content. <laughs> oh, amen, baby. Fantastic question. So there's an old quote that is attributed to Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. It actually wasn't him, but it's attributed to him. that says, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Passion is everything. And passion can be at any level. It can be a huge passion where you're clearly very, very excited about what you're saying, and that makes you more animated and more interesting to watch. Passion can also be very, very quiet and very small because it comes from within. As long as people know that you deeply care about what you're talking about, that is what animates you. But if all you're doing is just regurgitating words, reading a script, copy and pasting things off of a website or out of a white paper or a mission statement. Your audience will smell that out a million miles away and they'll realize they don't care about what they're saying. They're not even paying attention to it. They don't even know. And that's when things get really dull. Fear is the other big motivator. And there are a million ways to deal with fear of public speaking or glossophobia. I'm not going to go into that because you can read a thousand books about it or listen to a thousand podcasts. But getting past the fear is frequently based on an idea of Am I creating value for others? As I look them in the eye, what am I there to do? Am I there to promote myself? Am I there to promote my brand? Or am I there to help them succeed? Am I there for their benefit? Speaking in general, corporate storytelling, it is about service. It is about serving others and creating benefit for others. And the more we start to think about why am I talking to people? Why am I asking to set their world aside and pay attention to me? Put down the phone. What's so valuable about what I have to say? You know what's most valuable? How can I serve you? How can I help you or benefit you? And that helps to motivate us and make us more interesting, more creative, and more inspiring in our message delivery. It's hard to do, 
If everybody could do it, you just pop a pill and everybody would be a creative, dynamic speaker. It's not the way it works, but it begins by serving others, realizing that we're creating value for them in order to set that fear of speaking aside and always making sure that we speak from a point of passion. I care and I want you to care. Do those three things, all of a sudden your creativity goes up, the boring quotient goes down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's hard in, in the beginning, but if you have experience, if you're consistent, then it's more simple. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Again and again and again, lather, rinse, repeat. And by the way, uh, we were talking before we started taping, uh, uh, rolling here, and you talked about failure, right? Mm -hmm. Getting it wrong. I don't know why people are so afraid to talk about their failures when they screwed up, because that's what makes us human. That is a learning experience. So get out there and communicate. Talk to people. You're not always going to get it right at first, as you just said a moment ago, Anatoly. Sometimes it takes time. But the more you do it, the more you practice, the more you repeat, the more you try, you will find yourself getting better and better and better. You'll become a more creative and engaging speaker, and you'll feel a lot of that fear and a lot of that boring start to slip away. Yeah. Uh, in my case, it's not sometimes. It's always. <laughs> <laughs> always. I don't believe that for a minute, mister. No, not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter what I can take. I, You know, I always create this... Uh, High expectations. Oh, I can be in this method, uh, this trade, but I always fail in the beginning. It takes time, so much time to craft my skills, to go ahead, to hone. But I don't know how to become uh, an Instagram star overnight. You know, mm. takes years, you know, of hard work. Sometimes people get fast results, but because of getting experience before, uh, I spoke with one. Uh, influencer he got like a few million followers everywhere and he mentioned that he started to gain this uh followers after 15 years of failing so he he failed he started to fail in my space in all social media and then magic happened <laughs> you know people started to follow him so yeah it, it's like to get experience acquire experience and uh, when you can become much better than your competitors, people will yes. follow you. Yes, yes. You know, it's interesting. I, I frequently work with startups, right? It's so easy for a startup organization to have a head of steam. They're excited. They're passionate. It's three people, four people, five people working together on a project, and it's just them, right? You see them in an event or an exhibit, and it's the founder of the company. It's the inventor of the product. That's who you're talking with. And then they develop enough of a following that they get funding. And all of a sudden now the venture capital is in and now they go to product launch. And now it's launched and they've set up a marketing campaign and that market launch propels them through the first six months, 12 months, 18, 24 months. And then what happens? Ooh, it all falls off a cliff because maintaining that passion, hanging on to that creativity after the exciting part is over when you just have to get down to work and you've got to expand and you've got to tell your story to more and more people to onboard to keep the momentum, that's where so many companies fall apart. This social and media influencer you were talking about, 15 years, the only way that person was able to do that was through personal passion. They believed that the story they were telling was valuable enough to their audience that they agreed to keep telling it until they found their audience and the audience realized, ah, oh, that's what I've been looking for. Passion will carry you so far in winning communication for your brand, for your organization, and for your role within that organization. The more passion you show for what you do, the better you become at your job and the more valuable an asset you become for your brand. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, uh, You remind me another story about Mr. Beast. When uh, he got first thousand subscribers after 18 months, uh, he didn't give up. He has this passion to film video content and uh, patience. And for me, you can win with patience if you passion, if you are passionate about something. Uh, it's the same like people watch TV six hours a day. It's a lot, <laughs> but they don't expect that someone will pay money for their hobbies. Uh, I can play basketball all my life, uh, soccer, ping pong. But nobody pays for my hobby. Uh, it doesn't stop me. To, I'm not good with that. Uh, I'm not professional, but I love it. So it's the same with content creation. If you love creating content, results will come. Don't care about results. Just be patient. And 
Can you tell about this patience uh, from your experience? Uh, for example, I see when content creators give up. For example, they wrote a few stories, failed, and stopped doing this because it doesn't work. I don't know how to get results from few stories. I think uh, uh, I love this example from Mr. Beast when he said, you need to feel a hundred bad videos, you know, to acquire some experience, not expert experience, but just some experience. So tell about patience more. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Time. Time is either an enemy or time is an asset. My view has always been stick with what you do, stick with what you know, stick with what you care about, and stick with what serves other people because that ends up serving you. Do it long enough and you naturally evolve into thought leadership in your particular area or sector, whatever it happens to be. But the key is you don't give up. And you view time as an asset, as a benefit, instead of as an enemy. If you give up after six months, eight months, one year, it's not going to work for you. You're just you're, you're going to move on and you're going to do that again and again and again and repeat that particular failure. Stick with it as long as you believe in it and it's going to pay off for you in the end. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Steve, I want to confess. Uh, I didn't put your book yet to my list. You know, uh, that book, you know, I have a huge list, a big list of books that I want to read, but I have no time to read all of these great books. Okay. I read them. I love this format, but I have no time. So before taking a new book, I usually get a review. Uh, I read reviews uh, from book offers, uh, from uh, readers, different reviews, like any products, customers before uh, buying products, 95% of them usually read reviews. So I want to get a review about your book. Can you give me and to my audience a strong reason why we need to read your book? What kind of value and benefits we can get by reading your book? I love that question. I couldn't love it anymore. And I'm so glad you asked. So the name of the book is Nothing Gets Sold Until the Story Gets Told. Corporate Storytelling for Career, Success, and Value-Driven Marketing. So much of it is right there in the title, which is a long title, but nothing gets sold until the story gets told. The idea being, if you just go out and try to sell something, it's never going to work out long term. You might have short term success. You might have anomaly success. You might have one off success. It's not going to correlate to a career or to the type of brand power that you are looking for in your role or for your organization. This particular book is about how do I get to the heart of my brand and the heart of my story? And I wrote it based not only on a quarter century worth of experience of literally every week telling stories on behalf of the largest and most successful corporations in the world, but I wrote it to make sure that every single page is not just what you should do, it's also, and here's how to go and do it. So no matter where you are in your career path, in your education, socioeconomic status, what it says on your business card, what your level within your corporation is, or how much marketing or sales experience you have, everybody should be able to pick up this book and on every page, not only hear the way to tell a better corporate story, but the actual tips, tricks, and methodologies to start doing it. So the reviews that you'll find if you go and you seek out the book, which you can find everywhere in hardcover, paperback, audiobook, ebook, whatever you like, you'll see that the reviews are saying, wow, holy moly, I wish I had read this thing back at the start of my sales career. Because had I known how to do these things, instead of somebody just saying, you should do it, this book actually says, and here's how I can actually get it done. And I wish I had it long ago. And that is why everybody should go out and grab a copy of the book. Yeah, nice, nice. So definitely I put your book in my list, huge list. So I'm going to read. Because I'm going to be sending you a copy when we're done. Cause you know, Florida's close by. I can't deliver it in person, but I can certainly pop it in the mail easily. Oh, okay, nice. Wow, awesome, awesome. Love it, love it. Uh, guys, I'll submit the link to this book uh, to Amazon uh, in the description below so you can read this book as well. Uh, Steve, uh, let's talk about mistakes more. Uh, what I found, um, uh, we uh, chatted a little bit about mistakes, that it's we need to do it, and everyone makes mistakes, including Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, all great entrepreneurs usually uh, make mistakes, but I found that some mistakes we can avoid. I mean, like to learn before doing something. So uh, that's okay if you do mistakes uh, and learn from them. But if you learn before, uh, you can uh, minimize 
the number of mistakes. So can you list mistakes that from your experience companies still do in uh, storytelling and your tips how to find another way? Oh, such a such a great question. Uh, one of the things that I teach in my training programs uh, is the power of the word no. No is a fantastic word and we tend to view it on a negative basis, but no can mean a combination of real success being the ability to kindly, confidently say no thank you, meaning it's not for me, it's not a right fit, letting something go. For companies, letting customers, letting clients go, saying I am simply not the right fit for you, but allow me to help you find who is the right fit, there's incredible power in that for you as a brand and for you within your own career path. So that's an error side of things, of saying, I'm not the right fit. I can't do what you need me to do. That's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is when a mistake is made, how do you communicate that mistake to your marketplace or to your team? One of the great aspects of executive leadership, executive presence, is how do you stand in front of your team and say, we screwed up, we blew it. That particular client, that huge project that we were gunning for, we didn't get it, didn't work out, went to another organization, or we blew the pitch. We were in there with the client, with the customer, we knew what they wanted from us, we just didn't give it to them. The key is to say, we got it wrong. However, look at what we learned from that. We will never make that mistake again. And the next time we get a similar opportunity, we're going to nail it to the wall. We're going to be brilliant at it. Every negative can be turned to a net positive. When you look at your team, when you look at your customer, when you look at your marketplace, and all you talk about is what you did wrong, now you're going to lose people. But if you say, we got it wrong, but man, oh man, wait for what's coming next, now you turn that to a net positive and you lift everybody back up again. So I'll give you a, a, a great example out of the book that I love. I watched the CMO of one of the largest companies on the planet lose their job in front of me in real time. So I was across the way from them telling a story for a partner brand, actually, not even a competing brand, but a partner brand. And what they were doing across the way had nothing to do with a real story. They faked it, like you said earlier. They thought that they could come in with some BS concept that would just get the audience engaged and interested, in, but it had nothing to do with the story of what their brand wanted to say. And the audience could tell, and they were leaving in droves. They would come in because it was interesting, and they would sit down, and they would start to hear the story, and, they, and you, could, you could read their subtext. They thought, what the hell is this? There's nothing happening here in front of me. Why do I, what, get to the point. What are you doing? Nah, it's not worth my time. And they would stand up and they would walk away. And at the end of the event, about a week later, uh, there was a big press release that came out that the CMO of the organization had been let go because of their disastrous showing at that particular event. So what did the company do? They didn't wallow in the failure. They announced the failure. They said, man, we did not tell the story that our marketplace wanted to hear from us. So here's what we're going to do differently. And they made it part of the announcement. They literally announced the own release of their, uh, of their CEO. And at the exact same time, they said, and here is what changes starting now. And it was amazing. You entered feeling, wow, they really messed up. And you left that same press release story thinking, but boy, how intelligent are they that they learned from their mistakes, they admitted them, and they're ready to move forward with a new powerful and clear light and clear story. That is how you turn failure into success. Perception is everything. Control the perception. You control the corporate story. Love it. Love it. Yeah. You know, you share stories everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Steve, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask about one aspect that I often see in storytelling style about uh, selfish, you know, when, uh, uh, especially, you know, I, I get a lot of requests to check LinkedIn profiles and, uh, I see selfish profiles when, uh, owners don't care about the audience, about customers. Uh, it's the same with writing stories when you can tell I'm great. I'm so great, but who cares if <laughs> you're great or not? Uh, customers want to become great. So can you tell how to change the approach? instead of selfishness, to tell about how you make your customers great? Oh, man, 
you are speaking my language now. That is such a great focus. All right, for anybody in your audience who knows the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, it is one of the great story structures of history. And the hero's journey has been touched on again and again and again in a million different ways. But companies, individuals, they make a mistake. They believe that they are the hero in the hero's journey when they tell their own story. And I always like to tell people, you are not the hero. You are not the hero. You are the ally. Your role is to make your audience, your customer, your client, your partner, make them the hero. Show them the path to their success. Take it, again, away from you. Take the spotlight off of you and turn it on to them. When you do that, you immediately achieve success. Why? Because everybody in the world is in the WIFM factor. If you haven't heard the WIFM factor, what's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M. Humans by nature are selfish and not because we're bad people. It's because we have a limited amount of time and we're being bombarded by tens of thousands of bits of stimuli every day. And we have to decide which of those stimuli are valuable and which of them don't serve our life in any way, shape or form. And most of what we hear falls in that second category, it just gets discarded, gets thrown out. We never hear it. We never pay attention to it and we don't give it any real credence. So. When you can become valuable to other people, you create value for them. What's in it for me? Here is what I can offer to you. So I always love to work with people and I say, all right, let's look at your story. If your story is entirely about you, how great you are, your success, your history, the awards you've won, you know what your audience is thinking? Good for you. <laughs> That's the end of it. We're done. And that is what 98% of speakers do. They get out there and they talk about their own brand. They talk about their own product, how wonderful we are. And the audience goes, eh. okay, <laughs> bye, gonna go. Um, I, I love to I love to tell the story here. Let's say that 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 I am in the market for a new vehicle. All right. And I'm gonna look at all vehicles on an even level. I'm going to look at the the BMW, I'm going to look at the Audi, I'm going to look at the Lexus, I'm going to look at the uh, uh, whatever, whatever brands had the Mercedes Benz, whatever it's going to be, but all equal. Which car do I want? Well, my dad was a BMW guy and I've had BMWs before, but I want a new vehicle. And I'm going to go to talk to all five of them and drive their vehicles. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to give me the metrics about their vehicle, how fast it is off the line, zero to 60 in this many seconds, this much torque in the engine, this drivetrain, this sound system, these comfortable leather seats. And here's the deal. BMW is going to talk about how their product is the best and they're going to show me all the numbers and the proof that it's the best. Then I'm going to go to Mercedes, who's going to tell me their vehicle is the best. They're going to show me all the numbers and the metrics that prove their vehicle is the best. Same with Audi. Same with every company that I go to. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get confused. I don't know which car. They're all good. They all have the, they all have the arguments why they are the best. And now that I don't know which to do, I'm just going to go back to the BMW because it's who I already know and who I already trust. And that's how most customers make their decisions. If you want to stand out from the crowd, if you want to create value, you have to differentiate yourself in some way. And that differentiation doesn't come from statistics. It comes from personal corporate storytelling. It comes from the heart. It comes from connection that creates differentiation. And the people that are most successful at doing that, Apple, right? McDonald's, Nike, look at the biggest brands in the world. Apple's the greatest example, right? You're driving down the street and there's a huge billboard in front of you with a beautiful photo on it. Apple is not going to tell you how many megapixels the phone has, what the technology is, how clear the lenses are, how fast it is. You know what it says on the bottom? Photo taken by Anatoly. Mm -hmm. They celebrate the customer. They make it about the customer. This beautiful photo was taken by this great guy. Yeah, using our iPhone but he's the one who took the photo. They celebrate the other, not themselves. They take notice, they listen, they care because you're making it about your audience and not about yourself. Love it. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah, I market a new car uh, for a long time, you know, and uh, I read a bunch of reviews, but you know, uh, as a marketer, I usually check how content was created uh, and what I found, uh, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, uh, any other brands, they usually uh, show uh, in the first visible screen uh, happy people, 
great environment. It's not like characteristics uh, that almost all cars have, you know, great characteristics, but it's more about to provoke emotions, you know, to tell, uh, look at, uh, uh, and it creates the feeling you can own some brand. You can own the car, you can use it. So I, I, I love this style, awesome style. And yeah. It's interesting, right? With the, with the, with the phone, think about what Apple does, why they're the most valuable brand on the planet. Mm -hmm. Very simple. They're not selling you a phone. They're not selling you a computer. They're not selling you any of these types of things. What they are selling you is a vision of success and a dream of the lifestyle that you hope to have. So what they're going to do is look you in the eye and say, wouldn't it be amazing if your life was sleek, compact, easy, you just open it up. You can share anything with anyone, anytime from any place, no buttons, just you, easy communication to a beautiful world. Does that sound good to you? Wouldn't you love to be a part of that? Cool. Buy this. And it gets you there. The product is the last thing they talk about. Yeah. They connect with the vision. Uh, a buddy of mine in Chicago, where I live, <clears throat> is a real estate broker. And he always likes to say that selling a home has nothing to do with talking about the value or the benefits of the home. You don't go through the statistic and you get them to imagine what their life would look like if this belonged to them. Where does the TV go? Where do the kids play? Where do we have cocktails with friends when they come over for the night? Imagine how great it's going to be to come home from work and experience that beautiful view out the window. And when you get them to start to imagine themselves in that home, you generate an offer. It's emotion, right? It's the old Carl Booner quote. They may not remember what you told them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. You just said it a moment ago. Spark emotion, you spark memory, you spark connection, and that leads to business success. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And you remind me of this message from uh, the first iPod. Uh, the message was like 10,000 songs in your pocket. <laughs> It's not like 10 gigabytes in your pocket. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can imagine 10,000 songs. <laughs> yeah. So Apple is good with that. <laughs> Steve, I have two questions left. Uh, by the way, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to... We can do this all day long. I get the sense yeah. we can do this for 10 hours in a row and have no problem with each other. But uh, yeah, for my dear listeners, I can tell if you have... A lot of questions as I have. You can read the book. You can reach out to Steve directly to ask all these questions. You can follow his content on social media. And uh, Steve, I have questions about um, that very important for me, for my audience too. Uh, I found that I have a lot of students who are looking for a way to learn from scratch. Uh, I have business owners who want to learn the basic before doing something uh, to hire great experts. And um, for example, if I see that my new customers don't understand what I do, I usually tell them, learn from my course, go to you to get the basic. If you understand how it works, then we can go, go ahead, can create great content, can win customers, but understand the basic. Even big companies have big issue with that uh for example i spoke with great accounting experts yeah this company earns a lot of money but they have no idea how to create content they are great with accounting you know with calculations but when i tell them you need to craft a story they can't they can't so i'm interested about you for example let's imagine you started today from scratch without any experience knowledge skills you didn't write this awesome book It's your first day in storytelling. What will you do if you started from scratch? Mm, love that. So number one, curiosity. The most interesting people in the world are curious about others. They want to learn as much as they can. They want to onboard as much as they can. They look for mentorship. And we always think of a mentor-mentee relationship in terms of literally going up to somebody and saying, hi, will you mentor me? We don't have to do that. My favorite mentor, I've never even met him. He runs an amazing podcast out of Canada. If you do not know Terry O'Reilly, go and seek out his podcast. It's called Under the Influence. It is the single most valuable chunk of information every time I listen to an episode because it's all relatable, understandable, and applicable for anybody. Everybody I send to that particular show is able to glean value out of it. And you know who goes? Only the most curious people. But there's value again and again and accessibility again and again. There's this old idea that 
until you know the rules, you can't break the rules. And a lot of people want to run before they can walk. They want to start out by doing something totally wild, totally different, totally unique, but they don't understand the basics, the rules yeah. first. So in your case, right, a content provider, I want to build a new podcast or I want to create some new messaging platform on social media. First, you have to understand how social media works, what audiences want, what they expect, what creates value for them. The way you're going to learn that, you're going to tune into this podcast and listen to as many episodes from Anatoly as you possibly can. You're going to go seek out those other value-driven podcasts that are about people and about the way they communicate to one another. And the more you listen, the more you'll start to say, ah, I get it. I get it. I get it. And now that I understand it, I know what I want to do to set myself apart. But you have to know the rules before you can break the rules. Curiosity counts. So if you're just getting started in this particular uh, area, in this particular venture, learn everything you can by listening and watching constantly. Learn your craft. Craft is everything. It's again, if you know, if you pu you pull up another uh, fantastic quote, Benjamin Franklin. Again, not really him, but it's equated to him. Is uh, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. The way you prepare for success in whatever you want to do, do it by listening to others, paying attention to others, gathering what they say, and learning from the experts. I'm telling you, it's gold. It's pure gold. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more. And I remember a coach, boxing coach, when he got new students, and some of them decided not to put hands uh, uh, mm. on their uh, face. And he told him, why? Why Why you don't want to uh, protect your face? And they replied, Roy Jones uh, doesn't do it. Vitaly Klitschko doesn't do it. What? <laughs> this... This... People are champions in the world, are the best. You need to learn from basic, you know, how to protect yourself. Then you can change the game. I think it's the same with storytelling. If you start the basic, just craft to become the best, then change the game, you know, yeah, change the rules. But you need to get the basic. Yeah, I agree. I love it, love it. And Steve, I have my final question. Uh, I always ask this question. It's very important uh, for me uh, to adapt whatever happens. And in digital marketing, we always do. Uh, it's not like in other niches. For example, I think, I, I don't want to say everyone, but almost everyone can use AI. Almost everyone in marketing, in content creation. But uh, when I spoke with accounting specialists, they don't use AI. Mm. And most of them ignore this tool. Uh, I repl I asked why. Uh, and they got, they don't need, they usually get basic information, often special, uh, generic. Um, I think it takes time for AI to occupy uh, all niches. Uh, but my main question about uh, the future. I want to ask you, take your crystal ball and let us know what kind of future will be in storytelling style. <laughs> oh. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Uh, we are still at the burgeoning. We are still at the very beginning. AI has been around for a long, long, long time, but it is finally becoming applicable, right? So uh, I used to spend a lot of time working for a corporation called Phonar. Most people do not know Phonar Corporation, but the founder of Phonar Corporation invented MRI technology. He was the inventor of MRI, hugely important. And then when it came time to deliver the Nobel Prize, Dr. Demadian did not win the Nobel Prize. It didn't go to him for inventing the technology. It went to three of his students who took that technology and made it applicable to the masses. Took MRI technology and said, now every doctor, every hospital, every patient can use it. That is what won the Nobel Prize. Same thing is in AI. AI is just getting started right now at this particular point. Anybody who believes that there's no value in it, or that it's going to go away, you're kidding yourselves. It is here not only to stay, but it is growing by leaps and bounds and very, very quick. And if you don't use it, you're going to be left, get left behind in the dust. The trick is to use it intelligently. So we talked about that earlier, right? The more you give it, the more it learns. However, it is just a foundational tool. It is not a replacement for a human being. My daughter is an artist. She is very frightened about AI-created art. However, she believes very deeply 
the AI can only do what a human teaches it to do. It can only work based on past successes. We create the future ourselves. So use AI as a foundation of your storytelling and then build on it to personalize that AI. Use it for research basis. It's great. Like I said, I just came home from Barcelona. A buddy of mine and I were standing in front of Casa Batlo, one of Gaudi's creations. And he said, tell me about the windows on Casa Batlo. And boop, pops right up there on his phone. Everything you need to know about the windows. Great for research, but it's not personal human storytelling. The human touch will always, always be victorious. So if I look into my crystal ball and I look 10 years, 15 years down the line from now, we are going to more fully recognize the limitations of AI and the requirement of the person to person, the human to human connection will always win out. We have proof of that literally based on, depending on what your feeling is, 400,000 years of human evolution. Every time humans try to separate from one another and let machines take over, we always go back to the need to be together. We are culturally driven to be human to human connection uh, animals. That's never going to fade with AI. AI will just become a valuable tool like so many other valuable tools we've created before. Awesome. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, I'm excited about the future. Me too. And uh, AI, I agree, AI is not replacing for human being, but it's a big replacement for someone who can ignore this tool, for lazy specialists, because <laughs> I, I only increase my revenue a lot with AI, but I know some people lost jobs because it's not AI, because of someone who can adapt AI and can replace uh the rest people so yeah it's like um ai can't replace experts but it's hard to compete with other experts who use ai so if someone uses yeah it's it's so tough to overcome them steve it's a big pleasure love it so valuable yeah i'm going to read your book i'm going to learn keep learning from you tell the best way how to reach out to you how to follow you how to uh yeah, I, I'll submit the book in the description below, but let us know how to keep learning from you. <laughs> Excellent. I am so easy to track down. So go to stevemolter.com or corporatestorytelling.com, and that will direct you to me and everything about me there. Um, I also have a uh, freebie for everybody who's listening in. If you're interested in doing it, if you go to corporatestorytelling.com slash guide, G-U-I-D-E, corporatestorytelling.com slash guide, you can then put in a code, and the code is sold told 23 all one word, lowercase, sold told 23 That's going to lead you to a free e-guide that I've created called Five Paths to Passionate Storytelling. Anybody can go and download that free e-guide right now, and it's five ways that starting today, no matter where you are, starting today, you can become a more successful and more powerful communicator by following these five easy steps. Anybody can do it, but there are five open doors that are waiting for you right now. Start to apply any one of them or two or three or four or five of them. And by tomorrow, you're already a better communicator, more successful in helping to tell your corporate story. So go and check that out. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. You're so kind to share more value. <laughs> you know, I'm going to test it to check it out, how I can improve my process. So you lead me to an emergency room. I need to spend time to think how to consume <laughs> all this data. <laughs> you, you are going to steal my time to read your book, but I know that I get a lot more benefits and revenue by reading your book. Thanks a lot, Steve. A big pleasure. Love it. So valuable. Uh, guys, you can find links in the description below to social media accounts, to the website, uh, to this uh, offer. And yeah, see you next time.